and welcome to another lecture of Intro to TV Production. Today we're going to talk about the video camera. What is a video camera and why are they so important to television production? This pretty much goes without saying, I'm sure, why video cameras would be so important to video production. After all, if we didn't have cameras, we wouldn't be able to record anything for later broadcast. But I want to show you some of the intricacies, some of the things that you may or may not know about video cameras. I know most of us have a video camera in our phone, and we probably have grown up with people who have shot home videos, things like that. In the television production world, the professional television production world, it's all about control. As I've talked about in past lectures, like when we use our studio here in this area, it's about control. And so we as professional television producers and television technicians, we want to control all aspects of the video camera. So we're going to talk about what we need to control in terms of the video camera and how we can make things absolutely look fantastic. First, I want to talk about four groups of video cameras. The first one that we'll talk about are these studio cameras here. The studio cameras are the same ones that I'm using here in the studio, in the studio of CEC. I've got these three large video cameras, and many of you have seen the three large video cameras that we use to do these various productions in CEC. One of the things about them, they never leave the studio. You'll never find them going out to field productions, sports games, and other things that are outside of the studio. They're generally confined to the studio, mostly because they're so large and bulky and take a tremendous amount of time to take apart, disassemble, uh, and part of that is also the pedestal that they're sitting on, which we're going to talk about in a future lecture, but it's very, very massive and heavy and very difficult to transport. They're, as I just mentioned, mounted on a pedestal. I will get you a shot of a pedestal at a later date. Actually, you know what? I'll probably just show you what a pedestal looks like. Many of you who have worked out here in the studio have already seen what a pedestal looks like. It's uh, what the camera sits on so it can be rolled around the studio. As we talked about in a past lecture, this CCU, this camera control unit, the cameras in a studio are connected to this CCU, which allows them to have control over, over color and iris settings and other things that we're going to talk about today. The last thing is they're very expensive. And when I talk expensive, I'm meaning very expensive, like as much or more than you would pay for an automobile that you may transport your family, your loved ones, your boyfriend, your girlfriend in. You always want to have that really nice car. Uh, a lot of times these cameras in these studios are worth about that much, if not more, especially when you get the lens, the pedestal, all the other components that are a part of that camera setup, the CCU and other things. You really start to get very pricey when it comes to these studio video cameras. Now let's also talk about this second group of cameras, the ENG and EFP cameras. These are generally self-contained. You've got the video camera along with some means of recording, whether it be a VTR that takes videotape or a digital drive, a flash drive, or other solid state uh, disk drive that will store the video on it. But they're generally also very expensive, especially in this professional world, which is really what I'm talking about with these first two groups, the studio and the ENG and the EFP cameras. That then brings us to the third group of cameras. That's the prosumer group. You can see with the prosumer group that we've got the combination of two words, the professional slash consumer. And you could think of this prosumer category as being kind of halfway in between professional and consumer. With prosumer, you're still going to be self-contained, like with the ENG and EFP cameras that we've talked about just a second ago but you won't have as many features. You'll have many of the features, but not all of the features of professional ENG and EFP cameras. The key to it is that they're cheaper. What you give up, though, is what I talked about at the beginning of this lecture, and that is control. You are a professional. You want control. And by allowing things to be cheaper, you're giving up some of these features that provide you with this control. They're becoming more accepted, especially in the professional world. 
It used to be that someone would say, oh, you got a consumer camera, it's not $80,000. It can't quite do what I can do with my very expensive, cool camera. And in, to a certain extent, that's true, but I'll tell you, in today's world, these prosumer cameras are becoming much more accepted because they're so much cheaper. They're almost disposable compared to the other types of cameras from the past. That then brings us to these consumer cameras. With the consumer camera, you have something that's very easy to use, but you do not have manual control. And as I've said, it is all about control. With these consumer cameras, they're very, very cheap, which is the reason why consumers are generally looking at them and purchasing them, but you're giving up that control that you need. Now, you have a camera here. It's right in your pocket. I keep mine nice and handy right here in my, in my pocket, right here close to my heart. But as you, I'm sure, are well aware, it's very, very lacking in any sort of control. It's really quite automatic. And it, we can debate on whether it's cheap or not. Uh, but you know, there's, you just give up a lot of control. You don't have the ability to zoom. You don't have the ability to control a lot of the color characteristics and other things. I always recommend people, if, if they're going to use a camera from their phone, that they get an app that allows them this level of control giving you as much control as possible so that you can make the picture look absolutely fantastic. Now, we need to move on and talk, get a little bit theoretical here, because we need to discuss how these video cameras convert light into electronic signals that can be played back later. So let's go ahead and take a look at this nature of light. I talked about last time in a past lecture about these three colors. The primary colors are one, two, three, red, green, and blue. The primary colors are one, two, three. Okay, I won't sing it again. What we're talking about here is what's called additive color. Additive color are the colors that are involved in producing light as opposed to subtractive color, which is what you're used to in terms of painting and coloring and using crayons and markers and all these things that are reflected light. That's subtractive color. So when we're talking about the nature of light in video production, we're talking about this additive color. And those primary colors are one, two, three, red, green, and blue, or RGB. Note in this, though, that if we mix red with green, we get yellow, which is one of the primary colors in subtractive color, which is interesting. I think it's fascinating. I'm not sure exactly why. But if you mix red light with green light, you're going to get yellow light. If you mix red light with blue light, you're going to get magenta light. If you mix green light with blue light, you're going to get cyan, which is this very cool light blue color here. Now note also that if you mix red, green, and blue in equal proportions, you will get, of course, right there in the middle, white light. So the lights that are shining on me here in the studio are white light. They're a combination of red, green, and blue in equal proportions. Now the camera, it is not as smart as our eyeballs. We may see white light when we're here in the studio. We may see white light when we're in a classroom. We may see white light when we go outside into the sunlight. But the camera's not quite as intelligent as our brain. In fact, it's downright stupid compared to our brain. Our brain says, well, these things should be white. The camera says, well, I'm not very sure what white is all about. And so what we need to do is we need to tell the camera what is white under certain lighting conditions. And what you'll generally find is you'll find in a studio something like this, which is a white card. You just hold it up, and you have white. This, of course, is just a poster board. It was used just 20 minutes ago, right before I came on to this video recording, so that the engineers in the CEC studios, JR, in fact, uh, was able to use this and tell the camera that under these lighting conditions, the lights that are coming down here in the studio, this is white. And if we were to take this camera outside right now and not make any adjustments to it at all and hold up this same white card in the sunlight, we would find that the color has shifted. It's not quite white. It's going to be a lot bluer than white. And I want to discuss with you why that is. As we take a look here, more about the nature of light. We have what's called color temperature. Color temperature. Now, don't get confused. Color temperature is not referring to how hot the light is. It does say temperature, but it's not how hot the light is, because that doesn't make any sense at all. It's really talking about this shift of color. This is an entire spectrum of color, all the way down here from the very red 
components of light to all the way up here to the very blue components of light. Now, here we get a little bit intense. This is the Kelvin scale. I recognize that many of you are probably not hugely into physics. You're not crazy scientists thinking, I'm going to understand everything there is to know about everything. And you may not quite understand what this Kelvin scale is. So I'm going to explain it as best I can for you so that you understand that daylight is generally up here in this blue region. The sky is blue, right? There's a lot of blue colored light coming in because of our atmosphere, that's what makes the sky blue. A lot of the blue wavelengths of light are coming through the atmosphere, which is why the sky is blue. But it makes the light coming from the sun more blue. Whereas light that's generated artificially through incandescent lights, tungsten lights, some of these other different components of light, the metal that actually glows in a light globe or a light bulb, will actually glow more in these regions down here. And then you'll also get things like fluorescent lights that will be somewhere in this weird greenish area, light yellow area, kind of light blue. It's kind of all over the place. And so what we find is if we are outside and we're shooting outside with our video cameras, the video camera, as I said, is stupid compared to us, it's going to say, well, the light is kind of blue. I'm just going to generate this blue light. And what we see is what should be white is actually kind of blue because it's the blue light that's coming in. If we were to take the camera under the same settings back inside, where the light is more this color, we would find that the camera can generate white just fine. This is not a huge big deal, you may think. You may think, well, so what? It doesn't understand what white is. The problem is, is that white, what is white, is the way we set the camera for defining all the other colors. So if we have some serious problems with the way we've set our color levels, we're going to have serious problems with the way things like my skin color and my uh, shirt color and things like that are generated and reproduced by the camera. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and go over and walk over here. I might surprise the guys just a little bit in the control room. I'm going to have them shift the white balance of this camera, camera two. And as they shift that white balance, notice how the light changes color. Let's go ahead and shift it back the other direction if we could. Yeah, let's, yeah, it'll get a little crazy now. A lot of yellow in there and stuff now. Go crazy with it, JR. Go ahead and Turn some serious knobs out of there. Do the black balance, too. Whoa, there we go, going crazy now. Look at that, we're shifting the color of the light. We're basic, not the light itself, I should say, the way the light is reproduced into electronic signals in the camera. So as you see, now we have a really blue cast to my skin. Now it's more green. We can really get crazy. And now I've probably messed it to the point where JR's like, I don't even know where white is anymore. I'm going to have him, as best he can, return it to where he thinks is the right way. But I'll tell you, the only way to know for sure is to hold up that white and then say, OK, I'm going to adjust the colors here, and we're going to go with white. That looks pretty good, actually. We'll go with that. So with regard to the nature of light, we've got this Kelvin scale. This is a measure of essentially how much blue or how much red is in the light. I know it's difficult for you to read here. This right here says 5,500 K, K for Kelvin. 5,500 K, and then there's a little arrow down here to about this color of blue right here. 5,500 K or 5,600 K, that K stands for Kelvin. About 55, 5,600 Kelvin is the color temperature, or you could think of it as just the color of daylight the light coming from the sun when you're outside and the sun's up. As the sun goes down at the sunset or sunrise, you'll actually see it getting a little bit warmer. And as we well know, when we look at sunsets, we're getting more orange, uh, those colors of light coming through, especially on the clouds. And so you'll see a shift down this way. So depending on the time of day, it could shift a little bit. But generally in the morning, you're going to be somewhere in this area. By about noon, 3, 4, or 5 o'clock in the afternoon, you'll get about up here. And then as the sun goes back down in the evening, you're going to go down here in this area. And eventually, it just goes dark. Contrast that with another well-known Kelvin scale temperature, which is 3,200 Kelvin, which is right here. 3,200 Kelvin, it says warm metal halide. OK, that's a lot to worry about, right? I'm not going to make you remember warm metal halide. What I do want you to remember is 3200 Kelvin is indoor light. 
it's kind of an average color temperature of the lights that are generated inside, whether it be inside our homes, inside the studio, and so forth. There's really those two color temperatures that I want you to know. 3200 Kelvin, which is indoor light, and 5600 Kelvin, which is outdoor light. 5600 Kelvin outdoor, 3200 Kelvin indoor. If you can remember those two, you'll really come close to where you need to go as far as color temperature is concerned when you're setting up the video camera. Now you may ask, why even worry about this? We've talked about a little bit about white balance. Why these two specific numbers? I'll tell you that a lot of professional video cameras will have specific filter settings depending on whether you're inside or whether you're outside. And those two are generally 5600 Kelvin, 3200 Kelvin. Now that's not true for all cameras, but a lot of cameras that do have filters on them, you can spin different filters in front of the lens. If you're outside, 5600 Kelvin. If you're inside, 3200 Kelvin. So that's what's really important about this color temperature scale. That's really the nature of light. That's the basics. You've got the colors of light, RGB. You've got the way these color temperatures are represented or the colors are represented using this Kelvin scale with the two, 5600 Kelvin and 32 Kelvin, 3200 Kelvin being the most important. Now we're going to move on to the imaging block, how this camera will actually convert light into electronic signals. What I want you to imagine, if you will, is my face right about here where my eyeball is right now. There it is. My eyeball is like the imaging device of the camera. And as we see, light is coming in. It comes in through the lens of the camera. The lens directs that light right here onto the imaging block, which you could imagine is just like my eyeball. The camera's eyeball is back there, back behind the lens. You'll have light coming in, directed by the lens, and then you get an image projected on the imaging device, that eyeball of the camera. Some of them may have this filter. I'm not too worried about you being, I don't, I don't care if you understand that. But this CCD thing, this single CCD for all channels, what do I mean by that, Dave? Dave, what's that mean? Well, some cameras will have one imaging sensor. They'll have just this one eyeball and it sees all of the light that's coming in through the lens. That sensor is called a CCD. CCD, wow, your bells are going off, right? Ding, 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 ding. There's another acronym. Yep, it happens all the time. Every single time we do one of these lectures, Dave comes up with another handful of acronyms for us to remember, and there's another one he's gonna make us know. Yeah, it's true, <laughs> totally. Hey, I know them, you should know them too, right? The CCD stands for Charge Coupled Device. Charge coupled device. I don't have it in text, I should. Charge coupled device. That's what that CCD stands for. It's essentially the imaging sensor, the eyeball of the camera, the thing that actually takes the light and converts it into electronic signals. In this single CCD camera, you've got one of them, one CCD for all of the channels of light. Now I wanna contrast that so that you understand what the channels of light are that I'm referring to. This is a camera that has three CCDs, three charge couple devices, or three imaging sensors, or three eyeballs, if you will. What happens is the light comes in, it's directed through the lens, and then right here we have this triangle-shaped thing. This is, is a prism. It's a prism that splits the light into three channels. You've got the red channel that's directed upward, You've got the blue channel that's directed downward. You've got the green channel that then is allowed to pass straight through the prism. So what it does is it separates all of the light coming in through the lens into the three primary colors, red, green, and blue. Red goes up to this CCD. Blue comes down to this CCD. Green then is projected onto this CCD. You've got three CCDs, each of them handling one third of the amount of information in the picture. One for red, one for green, one for blue. Now, think about this one, a little pop quiz. Which has higher quality in terms of its ability to reproduce video signals? The one that has only one CCD for all of the colors of light, or the one that has three CCDs, like having three separate eyeballs all seeing one third of the picture? 
I'll give you two seconds to think. Yes, three CCDs gives you a higher quality image. You've got one CCD, one imaging sensor, for each of the channels of light that are coming in. That's one way that you can get higher quality in terms of your video cameras. You have more than one CCD. One CCD usually is found in consumer cameras. Three CCDs usually found in professional cameras. Uh, every once in a while, you'll get a little bit, you'll have a consumer camera that has three. Uh, you'll have consumer, well, I'll tell you what, professional cameras never have one CCD. It's more expensive, though, as usual. And the more quality you get, the more expensive things are going to be. And so you'll have a camera that has three CCDs. It's also the size of the imaging chip, the size of the CCD that matters. Uh, some consumer cameras will have very, very small, one-third of an inch sized CCDs, where some professionals will have two-thirds of an inch, twice as the size, which means better image reproduction, better ability to uh, reproduce that light into electronic signals, and uh, that makes it so that later they can be viewed with higher quality. All right, that gives you an idea of how these cameras fundamentally work. That's the way they're converting light into electronic signals. In the next lecture, we're going to talk about how the lens works to direct that, because there's a lot of control we can have over lenses. But now I want to move on to a new topic, and that is cables when it comes to studio cameras. There are three types of cables that you'll find that are in between the CCU, or the camera control unit, and the camera out in the studio. The first one is called multi-core. With multi-core cable, you've got all of the different signals that are required by the video camera being sent down the cable over many, many different wires. For example, the camera I'm looking at right now, it has, it has a video signal, it has an intercom signal, so that the audio can go back and forth to the camera operator. It has a tally signal when the red light's on. It has a, an other audio uh, signal that allows a microphone to be connected to it, and then that audio signal can be sent down to the CCU. It also has power and many other different types of signals. In a multi-core cable, this one, like this one here, I don't have a good picture, I guess. I should have a picture for you. I'll just have to show you an example in class. But multi-core is basically a bundle of cables. You can imagine just one cable that has a whole bunch of cables inside it. And each of those little cables inside there is carrying a different signal, one for the video, one for the audio, one for the intercom, one for the tally, and every other thing that there is. Contrast that now with triax. Triax uh, doesn't matter, but it's short for triaxial cable. But with triax, you've got all of those signals the power, the tally, you've got the, in fact, JR's just going to grab me one really quick. Thank you, sir. You've got this one connector, one cable that allows you to have all of the signals being transmitted. Now, it's very difficult for you to see in there. I'll show it to you in class, but if you were to look inside the connector, you've actually got three different wires in there. You've got one that's right in the middle, you've got another outside one, and then you've got the way outside one, which is actually the connector that I'm holding on to. This is called triax, triaxial cable, and it's a signal that's high, it's a, it's a cable that's higher quality, and it allows for all of those video and audio signals, the intercom, the tally, and so forth, to be sent over that one cable. Jeez, which is easier, the cable that has a bunch of cables inside it, or the one that has essentially one cable that transmits all of that information? Well, yeah, the triax is a lot nicer. It goes further, too. You can take a triax cable and have your camera maybe a mile away from its CCU, where with a multi-core cable, you're going to have maybe 300 feet, something like that. Triax is better, but I'm sure you recognize by now, triax is also more expensive. Now, let's then talk about this last one. This is fiber optic cable. Fiber optic cable is literally cable that transmits its information through light information. It's actually not electronic signals, it's light. So this fiber optic cable, it takes all of the signals, tally, it takes video, it takes audio, intercom, all these signals that need to move back and forth between the camera head and the CCU, it converts all those signals into light pulses, and then it sends them on a wire that's literally a wire made out of glass, which allows the wire to be, the, the light that goes down that wire to be 
kind of reflect it on down the wire until it reaches the CCU, where the CCU then kind of decodes it and splits it back out into video and audio and intercom and tally and all the other things. Fiber optic is very cool. You can go miles and miles and miles away from the CCU with the camera head and not have any noticeable loss in quality of picture. So we've got three different kinds of cables. We've got multi-core, we've got triax, we've got fiber optic. Which is the nicest? Well, of course, fiber optic gives you the most control, gives you the uh, most flexibility because you can have the camera located very far away from the CCU as compared to triax and multi-core. But which is the most expensive? A, B, or C? Ding, 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 fiber optic is the most expensive. It is literally a wire or a cable made out of glass fiber, and uh, it's also a little bit more fragile if you think about it, but it's more expensive. So multi-core, not the best, but it, you can get away with it for short runs. Triax is much nicer, but more expensive. Fiber optic, even nicer, and the most expensive of all. I've talked a lot about this CCU, this camera control unit. I mentioned that a lecture or two ago as well, taught you about the acronym. We must discuss during this time what this CCU actually does. Well, first of all, it's a power supply for the camera. The power supply for the camera. A camera, like any electronic device, requires electricity. It requires actually quite a bit of electricity, depending on how nice the camera is. That CCU will take the wall electricity that you would plug into the wall, it converts it into an electricity, an, electri an electrical signal, electro electrical uh, power rating, I guess you could say, that's compatible with the camera. And then it will send that power down through the multi-core or through the triax or through that fiber optic cable, and it will power the camera so that you don't have to, on the camera head end, plug the camera into an outlet. That seems kind of no fun, right? You send a cable that has all this information on it, then you have to plug the cable in on the other end, plug the camera in, that would be no fun. So the first thing the camera control unit, or CCU, does is it provides power for the camera head. With triax, that power is actually 160 volts of direct current, 160 volts, which is actually quite a lot of voltage. If you happen to see a triax cable, which is the ones we use here at the Community Education Channel, if you see a triax cable that's damaged, I want you to not touch it. In other words, if you can see the uh, metal strands of cable instead of the rubber that should be uh, housing that cable. I don't want you to touch it, I want you to notify me or one of the engineers here at CEC because I don't want you getting zapped. Now there's some protections that the CCU will do to make it so that people don't get electrocuted, but we always wanna be safe when we're working with this equipment, right? So yeah, 160 volts of direct current being generated by the power supply in the camera control unit. The other thing that a camera control unit or CCU does is what's called multiplexing. With multiplexing, you've got all of these different signals that I talked about earlier. You've got the intercom, you've got the video output, you've got the return video, which is the program video that's being sent back to the camera so that the camera operator can see what is currently being shown on program. You may not understand why exactly you may need that, but it's important for camera operators to see what's currently on program. It also provides GenLock video. We're going to talk about what GenLock is in just a second. It provides audio output, like I said, a microphone that's connected to the camera. Intercom, so that the camera operator can talk to the control room. Tally, the red light that comes on when the, when the camera is currently live. And then, of course, power. So the CCU will take all of these signals, it will combine them, and then that's, that process of combining is called multiplexing, and then it will send it along that cable. Now understand that this is only done with triax and fiber optic. With multi-core cable, it, there is no multiplexing going on because each of these signals that are, are, are coming down the cable all have their own little cables to go through. Even though all those cables are bundled up into one large cable, there's still individual cables inside there. So you'll only find multiplexing with triax or with fiber optic cable. We here at CEC, we use triax, and so our CCUs will do multiplexing. All right, so this idea of GenLock, I mentioned I was going to talk about it in just a second. Here we go, it's a second later. We need to talk about this thing called a sink generator. Sink generator, now this is not a factory that produces kitchen sinks. 
<laughs> it's a joke, yeah. Sink generator, a factory that produces sinks. Sink gen okay, yeah, yeah. It produces sink. It's basically, sink is a crystal controlled, meaning that it's very, very, very nice. It's very, very nice and solid. It's a beautiful video signal. A lot of times it's just, it's black, but the video signal is very, very, very nice. And so the sync generator will generate this, and this is what all other devices in the control room, the cameras, the VTRs, and other things, they kind of use this sync, this genlock, this nice, solid video signal that's generated by the sync generator, and all of the timing, all of the uh, other aspects of it, they, they basically base all that they do, all that they think about on this sync signal. I'm gonna talk about what genlock is on the next slide. But uh, that's another thing that it does. It'll make more sense if it doesn't quite just yet. The other thing a sync generator will do is it will generate test patterns. This is a test pattern. This one is called color bars. Uh, most specifically, it's called NTSC color bars, or the National Society of Television. I don't know what NTSC stands for. I'm not going to give you another acronym. I should have tested you on that, right? But it generates this test pattern. The test pattern, notice it has red, it has green, it has blue, it has yellow, it has cyan, it has magenta. It's got all three of those primary colors. It's got the three non-primary colors, the secondary colors, and then it also has pure white, it has pure black, it has 80% white, and it's got various levels of black down here as well. This test pattern is used all the time in television to ensure that the video camera and all the other electronic devices, the VTRs and other things that are generating video, are perfectly oriented to one another. They're showing the exact same picture at the exact same time. And this sync generator, this crystal controlled solid video signal is used to genlock cameras. Now let's talk about genlock. I've got such a beautiful picture for you of genlock. If you can imagine, this is camera one. Here's the video picture, the frame of camera one. Here's camera two. This is the video picture of camera two. And let's just say that we've got two monitors, one for camera one and one for camera two. And we were able to slow things down a lot, slow things down immensely, slow down time, so that all of us were moving slowly. What would we see? We would see, as I talked about on a previous lecture, the scanner would be scanning and generating these lines, these horizontal lines that make up the video picture. Well, if we were to just take a quick snapshot of camera one and camera two next to each other and freeze those lines being drawn, we would probably find that camera one was here or somewhere else and camera two was down here. They're in different locations relative to one another. This is if it was ungenlocked, meaning that they weren't synced together. The problem is, is that if we were to cut from camera one to camera two, we would have a jump in where the scanner is, which would cause a flicker in the picture, which would not be good. Not good at all, in fact. If we contrast that now with genlocked cameras, these are cameras that have that same crystal controlled, wonderful, black video, the scanner is in the same location for everything that generates video, the cameras, the VTRs, anything that's going to be used. So that when the signal or when the switcher is switched from one source of video to another, there's no jump. Where it was here, it will move to camera two, it's right there ready to go. So we have two video pictures and they're synchronized together. That's the sync generator that generates that crystal controlled, wonderful, beautiful looking uh, black video that's used to uh, generate the signal that all other video devices use so that we don't get any of this issue relative to switching back and forth between different video signals. Oh my good gracious, am I getting all technical on us? Am I getting crazy? Have you got the most questions you've ever had before? Do you not understand? 
I have a feeling that you may not understand everything that I've explained. I would fully expect you to ask questions either via Canvas or through our class time when we meet here in the CEC studio. Make sure you understand these concepts. Many of them are on the exam, and I fully expect that you'll understand them. All right, I want to move on now to what's called gain. Gain is literally electronic amplification. You actually have the electronic signal that's generated by the camera being amplified somewhere else other than the camera. Electronic amplification or gain is measured in dB. I, I will tell you it stands for decibels, but you don't have to worry about that. dB. You may see plus 3 dB or plus 6 dB, which is more gain. You've got 3 dB, 6 dB, 9 dB, 12 dB, 15. There's lots of dB values for gain. The higher the number, the more gain. The problem with gain is, or what it does, I guess you could say, is it makes the picture brighter. Uh, and this is very good when you have low light. If the iris is wide open, the lens is allowing as much light through as possible, but there's still not enough light to generate a decent signal, you're going to have issues related to the picture looking bad. So you could use gain. It will amplify the signal, make it brighter. The issue is it will also cause what's called noise, which is kind of dirty picture. All right, here's a, a picture of gain. So here's just this nice photo. If I put 3 dB of gain in, notice that the image got brighter. If I put 6 dB of gain in, it gets brighter still. The issue is, and I'm sure it's very difficult for you to see on that, the issue is, is that it provides more noise as well. I'm going to try an experiment here, too. I'm on camera one now, and I've asked JR to use the CCU in the control room and add some gain. So go ahead and do that, JR. As you can see, it's all brighter. My shirt is even overexposed. Some of these areas are overexposed. So one of the benefits of gain is it will make the picture brighter. Let's go ahead and put in more, ga more gain. If you, Yep, there's more. Now it's even overexposed horribly. It feels like I'm on the surface of the sun. Uh, and let's, let's put in a bunch of gain now. And that's all of it. That's all the gain we've got. It's hard for me to see from this distance whether you can see the noise that's generated inside there, too. Let's go ahead and close the iris just a little bit while you're in there, JR, to, to fix the exposure. And uh, maybe drop the gain out and, and fiddle with the exposure a little bit. And maybe we can see a difference in the amount of noise in the picture. It may be impossible based on this being a streaming video. But uh, you get the idea. You get better, more light, I should say, especially in low light. If I was to turn the lights down in here, we could increase the gain, and we could probably pull off a decent exposure. But the issue is, is you end up with more noise in the picture. I always tell students, I say, imagine that TV show Cops, where they're always out there with the police officers. They've got whatever lights available to them. Sometimes they have a light on the camera, but they can't use it. And so they'll just have that light off and they'll just increase the gain. You'll see really, really grainy, dirty looking, flickery things on the, on the screen, but at least you can see what's going on. That's gain. All right, let's move on to another concept then, and this is shutter. The shutter adjusts the exposure time of each frame. Now, I'm gonna, let me get through this information, then I'll explain it as best I can. It's a hard concept for students to understand. We may have a frame exposure time of one two thousandth of a second, or one four thousandth of a second. All right, what do you mean by this shutter, Dave? What does this mean? I told you on a previous lecture that frame rate may be something like 30 frames per second, or even 29.97 frames per second, or 24 frames per second. That is a typical frame rate for cameras in video production and TV production. With shutter, what we're doing is we're taking each of those 30 pictures, and each one of those pictures is only being exposed, it's only being shown the light that's being reflected into it, 
for one two thousandth of a second, or one four thousandth of a second, or one one hundred twentieth of a second, something like that, a fraction of a second. So even though each frame is representing one thirtieth of a second, if you can imagine there's 30 frames per second, each of those frames was only exposed for some fraction of that amount of time. Dave, why do we care? Why does it matter about shutter? Well, you can imagine something like this, where I'm kind of moving slowly. 30 frames per second is really not that big a deal. But if we were getting things that were moving really, really, really fast, things like, uh, say, ejection seats or race cars or uh, fast-moving motorcycles, something like that, and we wanted to slow that down and look at each frame and look at things frame by frame by frame, we would find that there's blur, that we get a really blurry picture because for the amount of time that the frame was being exposed, that 1 30th of a second, that car or motorcycle has moved a certain amount and it's blurry because of that. So if you can imagine that one frame of video is only being exposed for 1 2,000th of a second or 1 1,000th of a second, that it's like a snap, just really quick moment in time. The car or motorcycle or whatever you're videotaping hasn't moved much in that amount of time, comparatively speaking. So the shutter is important, but it's really only important if we're shooting something that's moving very, very, very fast. Something that we don't generally see in normal television production, but does come up. Uh, for example, I do uh, on occasion shoot uh, tests of uh, ejection seats, and those move very, very quickly. And to shoot them without having a shutter of one one thousandth or more of a second, uh, there's not the ability to look at each individual frame very easily. So that's the shutter. Now, I don't want to give you, I, I can't really give you a good example of what the shutter looks like here in the studio, because it really only is effective if we are shooting something that's moving very, very quickly. The next concept I want you to understand is what's called a moray. Now, I know that word looks like more, M-O-I-R-E, but it's actually pronounced more. In fact, if I had uh, really been awesome, I would have put a little accent mark above the E in that word so that you would know that it's more. But that's actually how you say it is more. What a more is, is it is, it's, an, it's, not, it's a problem. It's not a good thing, all right? You have close, high contrast lines that can produce unwanted moving rainbow effect. Oh my good heck, that's the worst definition I've ever heard of. M worst definition ever. Close high contrast line that produces unwanted moving rainbow effect. I can't even really demonstrate this on me because it's hard to demonstrate. I'll show you a picture, maybe it'll show up, maybe it won't. But if you could imagine I had very close spaced lines on my shirt, or a tie that had really, really close together lines, or if we pointed this camera at some blinds that are in a window, something like that. Really, really closely spaced horizontal things. Uh, you'll get what's called a moray, which is kind of, a, it's kind of an ugly looking, weird rainbow looking thing. Uh, that's the best way to describe it, a rainbow looking thing. Let me show you this picture. Very, very difficult to see. You can kind of see kind of this rainbow here. Maybe you can, I hope you can when you stream this out of canvas. Uh, you may see brighter color here, then a darker one, and then a brighter and darker. Uh, that's just a suit, that's some guy wearing a suit, uh, but because of the nature of the way television is reproduced, video signals in general, you'll get this moray, which is this unwanted rainbow thingy whenever you have closely spaced horizontal lines. Again, it's difficult for me to demonstrate this in the studio because uh, I don't have anything that is horizontal on my body, uh, like stripes or anything like that, any clothes on my body that would look like that. But uh, that's a moray. We'll see if we can demonstrate this next time you come into the lab. One thing I can demonstrate for you is something called black level. I have an, a picture here I'll show you first, and then we'll uh, go on to camera and I'll show you what black level looks like as far as the camera. This is that same picture we were, talked about earlier. Now with black level, we're talking about the darkest parts of the image. Notice this man's suit as I switch to this. The suit gets darker, it gets blacker, and even their hair gets a little bit darker as well. The darker areas get darker. So if we look here, this is the original image, and here's the, with the black level increased or decreased. Original, notice the suit, 
There's the original, there's with black level decreased, and so forth. All right, I'll show you what this looks like in here in the studio. I'm going to have uh, camera one come up, and then JR, let's go ahead and decrease the black level. Uh, it, looks like you, it looks like maybe increasing. Let's go the other way. Let's drop it down all the way as much as you can. That's what I get for not wearing a dark shirt, right? You really could probably only see it here in the, in the bush. Let's go all the way the other direction now, JR, if we could. There we go. It gets darker now. I can go back the other way, open it up. Notice it gets lighter here as he opens it up. Uh, if we were really on my face, really zoomed in, we'd probably see like my beard and stuff getting really, really dark. That's the black level. If I had had darker clothes on, you would see it much more easily. But one thing that we can talk about that I know you'll be able to see is video level. This video level is the widest areas of the picture. The widest areas of the picture are affected when it comes to video level. Now I know it's black level for one and video level for the other as opposed to white level. Uh, I don't know why that is, but that's the way it is. You've got video level. Video level will affect the widest areas of the image or the lighter areas. So if we go to this, notice the dress, notice the background, uh, notice even the guy's forehead. You can see a big difference. So in this image, he's got kind of a whitish area on his forehead where the light is reflecting. But as we move to this image, that's enhanced and you get a lot wider area. It almost looks like his forehead is burned. <clears throat> the dress also gets a lot wider as well, as well as the background because there's so much white in there. So we'll do the same thing here, uh, and I'll show you with more video level. We can see wider areas get wider. Uh, the same thing with the, the computer, uh, my shirt, and so forth. Let's drop it down quite a bit. You can see that uh, even the areas that would normally just be kind of medium are really dark, and my face is really dark as well. Uh, so there's a lot of control that way. The white level and the black level, you can imagine as those things are shifted back and forth, we can really, really adjust what the picture looks like. Uh, and so what we want to do as professionals is we want to understand that we can have control over the picture. We can have control over the color. We can have control over the video level, which is essentially like brightness. We can have control over the black level, which is a lot like contrast. It affects the contrast quite a bit. We have control over gain, we have control over shutter, or shutter speed, as it's sometimes called. It's all about control when it comes to the video camera. You, in this class, are going to learn a lot about these video cameras. We're going to experiment. We're going to talk about how to tell the camera, this is white. We're going to talk about how to tell the camera, this is the proper exposure, this is the proper brightness, this is the proper contrast, the proper video level, the proper black level, and so forth. We will learn that in this class hands-on. So understand the concepts as best you can, and then we'll talk about it when we get into class. Now this brings us to the last thing that I want to talk about. This is as good a time as any to discuss what are called connectors. These connectors, uh, I can really only show you pictures of them, and as best you can, you need to recognize these. These will come up on not only exams, but as you participate in lab activities, you'll be required to fetch specific cables, and you know what kind of cable it is based on this connector. The first one we're going to talk about is one of the most common video connectors in television. This is called a BNC connector, a BNC connector. Oh, another acronym, I know it. This one, I don't care if you know the acronym. It's British Naval Connector, it doesn't matter. But you do need to recognize BNC connector. A BNC connector, what it does is it has this uh, kind of screw component to it. Uh, it has uh, the, here's the center pin right here. This is called the sleeve around the outside. What you'll do is you'll just slip this on and give it a quarter turn and then it's locked into position. It is a video connector and it's a BNC connector. A lot of times you'll hear the guys call, the, call a cable that has BNC connectors on it a BNC cable because of the connectors that are on it. So if someone says, hey, I need a 100 foot BNC cable, what they're talking about is a 100-foot cable that has BNC connectors on both ends. It's used to move video from one place to another. The next one is also a video connector. This is an S-video cable. This is a male. This is a female. Oh, my good gracious. Male and female. I get into trouble all the time. I don't want you to be offended. I'm just going to tell you how it is. 
You can yell at me if you want to. You can be offended, but I'm going to give you the true definition so that you understand, and then we're going to not visit it again. But I have had students in the past who have asked me how we know a male connector from a female connector. Uh, and I will just tell you so that you understand. That's why I'm here is to teach you uh, the male connector. Uh, it has a pin uh, or some other component uh, that would be inserted into the, uh, the, the, uh, <laughs> the receptacle. Thank you, JR. Yeah. It's hard for me. I, yeah, I understand the nature of this, understanding what male and female is all about. But you've got the pins on the male connector, the receptacle on the female connector. The pins go into the receptacle. If that grosses you out, if you're thinking 11th grade biology, do whatever you want. But that's what it is. So we have the male connector here, S-video connector. We've got the female S-video connector here. Uh, and you, you can tell because the male connector has pins, the female connector has receptacles. That is an S-video cable. It has S-video cables or connectors on the end. Uh, not as common in our professional television industry, but still a cable that you'll, you'll come across uh, in more consumer uh, video these days. The next one, this is an RCA or a phono connector. Uh, with an RCA connector, this can transmit both video and audio. It has this pin that comes out. It has the sleeve around the outside. You'll find this a lot in consumer equipment. A lot of times these will be colored, uh, the sleeve here will be colored yellow or red or white, depending on what kind of signal is being transmitted. If it's yellow, it's usually video. If it's white, it's the left channel of audio. If it's red, it's the right channel of audio. But it's an RCA connector. Uh, this just slips on to uh, its receptacle. Of course, this is the male connector. It has the pin, uh, but this is an RCA connector. If someone says, I need a five-foot RCA cable, then they're looking for a five-foot cable that has RCA connectors on the end. You do, on occasion, hear this called a phono connector, although not very common in the professional world. All right, XLR connectors. We're moving on now into Foley audio connectors. That RCA cable, the last one, could have been either video or audio. The XLR connector generally is associated with audio. XLR. Another acronym, uh, neutral left and right. Don't, you don't have to know that. Just understand that this XLR connector is something you'll use with audio most generally. All right, pop quiz, which one's the male, which one's the female? Uh, XLR connectors do confuse students on occasion as far as male and female because it appears to uh, many people that this right here is essentially a large pin but in reality, it is not. They might say that's the male connector. Uh, with the XLR connector, you're going to have the three pins here that are inside, uh, and the receptacles here. And so the female connector is here. The male connector is here. It's an XLR connector uh, used generally for professional audio, used a lot in our world. Someone tells you, I want a 100-foot XLR cable. They're looking for a 100-foot cable that has XLR connectors on both ends. Generally, you'll have the male on one end, the female on the other, so that they can be connected together to make longer runs of cable as well. A couple more. This is the quarter-inch connector, or also called a phone connector, although not very often. Most of the time, you'll hear this as quarter-inch. Uh, the diameter of the pin is a quarter-inch. That's why it gets its name, a quarter-inch. Uh, what we have here is a generally an audio connector. Uh, it can be three different signals running along there. You can see there's three different bits of metal here uh, that are separated by this plastic area. So there's three different elements of electricity that are going along this cable. But what you need to know at this point in our television career is that this is a quarter inch connector. You can tell it's a quarter inch because the diameter of the pin is a quarter inch. And of course, this is the male because it is a pin as opposed to a receptacle. And lastly, this is the eighth inch connector, also called a mini or a headphone connector. This one you're very familiar with. This is how you plug your headphones into your iPod, right? And so uh, you have the eighth inch, the pin here, the diameter of the pin is an eighth of an inch. You can imagine now if you've never seen the quarter inch connector, it's twice the diameter of your headphone connector. But uh, very typical in headphones, uh, most especially, but you'll also see it in other uh, small-scale audio devices. That is the eighth inch, or the mini, or the headphone connector. 
Now, when we actually get into the lab component of the class, let's go ahead and go, come up to camera two. As we get into the lab component of the class, I'm going to, to demonstrate these cables for you, show you what they, they look like in person so that you have a better idea. Uh, we're also going to talk about how to roll cables. Uh, I'll tell you, it can make a fool out of anybody trying to learn how to roll up cables correctly in the television world, but we're going to learn about that. So there's lots of things to do in the lab activity during the classroom time that we have scheduled. Uh, but if you have questions about what we've talked about today, I know it's a lot of theory, a lot of uh, difficult things to talk about via video, I do invite you to ask me questions. If you've got questions in mind right now, type them up, shoot them to me in Canvas. Uh, otherwise, uh, wait until we meet again in class and ask me at your leisure. And I look forward to seeing you on the next lecture.